Thanks for checking out the weekly sermon from Church of the Resurrection. I pray that God will use this message to speak to you and help you grow in your faith journey. If you're in the KC area, I'd like to invite you to join us next week at one of our services or join us in live worship online at core.org worship. Church of the Resurrection is one church in multiple locations. To learn more about the service times in our ministries, please visit core.org. Hope you enjoy this week's message. To honor all copyright restrictions, we have removed some video and audio elements from this message. As we continue in worship, I invite you to hear these words of scripture. Our passage today is from the Gospel of Luke. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in desolate living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and our understanding of scripture. Hi, for those of you who are new to Church of the Resurrection in the last few weeks, my name is Adam Hamilton. I'm the senior pastor here. And while I'm on sabbatical, I'm interviewing really interesting people. And I thought on this Father's Day weekend, I would interview two of the people who are the most interesting people in my life. And those are my two daughters, Danielle and Rebecca. So, uh, you know, people know a little bit about you. One of you has a plant shop and a plant bus. And the other one of you is a lawyer working for justice as a public defender and grows flowers. Which of you is which? I'm the lawyer. I'm the one with the plant shop. Well, I'm proud of both of you and the, and the work that you do. So uh, as preacher's kids, tell me one funny or humorous story about growing up as PKs in this church. Well, one story that might be funny to some uh, is also probably my most humiliating moment, which was when I was 15 or 16 on Christmas Eve when there were, I don't know, 10 or 15,000 people here for worship that evening and you decided to tell everyone about the rules for me dating. Um, and so that was by far the most humiliating thing uh, you've ever done. Although I suppose maybe not by far because you have some close contenders at other moments. <laughs> That's true. And I am really sorry for that. You know, I realized afterwards that that was not the brightest thing, but you know, I thought it was funny at the time. <laughs> I realized it was not funny to you. I'm so mm -hmm. sorry. I know you've been traumatized by that for the rest of your life. And so many other things. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, how about you? Well, I always tried to make the, he's the, the main pastor work for me. So I, uh, one time when there was a boy that was taking me to some dance, high school dance, I uh, had you bring him into this office, took away all the throw pillows so there was nothing he could touch and a big bright lamp shining right on him and had you ask him a lot of questions before he took me out. I got a kick out of that. <laughs> um, but also I would always have you, uh, or I would always use you in either Sunday school or wherever, just saying, do you know who my dad is? And people wouldn't be able to discipline me, or so I hoped, uh, just like a little brat. <laughs> You could be a little brat sometimes. That's true. It's pretty funny, though. All right. How about one thing you appreciate about having grown up in this congregation as preacher's kids? It's always really felt like an extended family of hundreds and now thousands of people. Um, you know, I remember one time when I was young and sick with pneumonia and somebody from the church sent a, a letter and a little angel for me to keep by my bedside. Um, as I was sick and little things like that always people always coming up with words of encouragement or coming up to say hi and um, It's always really felt like a huge community of people who were there for us and supporting us and caring about us Which has really been nice. Mm. I love that. Yeah, absolutely I mean just constantly I feel like people would come up to us whether after church or even out around Kansas City if they recognized us they would come up and just 
thank us for just being part of your family or just encourage us in any number of ways and tell us that they were thinking about us. And it was just so thoughtful and people will go out of their way to, to do that. And it's, it's really beautiful. Well, I think this congregation did feel, feel like you were a part of their extended family too. They loved your stories and they have loved you. And you know, who you are as women today was shaped in large part by growing up in this church in profound ways. So anyway, I love you both and, and so grateful that you're my daughters. Dad, we love you. We love you. Happy Father's Day. Oh. We're very proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. So very proud of you. Thanks. Love you, girls. Love you. As we continue in worship, I'm going to invite you to join me as we go together to God for a moment of prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of today and for drawing us together in worship. We pray now that you would meet us right where we are. Take the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, measure them, find them always to be acceptable in thy sight. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today we are concluding our series of sermons where we've been focusing on what's streaming this Sunday. We've been paying attention to and reflecting over some of our favorite movies uh, during the pandemic, most of which we streamed uh, in the comfort of our own homes. Uh, a lot of the content that we have been consuming has come from, uh, you know, our devices, from streaming services and platforms. And, and, uh, and so we've been recounting a lot of what we missed out on together because we weren't able to go to the movie theaters. Uh, fast fact, I actually was able to go to a movie theater this week for the very first time in almost a year and a half. I got a chance to take my son Freddie, who turned six this week, to see Peter Rabbit number two. And uh, it was a great experience. We were so excited to be back in the movie theater. Uh, but one of the things that we rem remembered about that movie is that that was supposed to be released last summer. And so for the last year and a half or so, so many movies were set to be scheduled uh, to be released that were just shelled for indefinite periods of time. And, and, uh, and so we haven't yet seen a lot of these blockbuster movies. We're still waiting for like The Matrix 4. We're still waiting for Ghostbusters, the next generation, or the reboot of, of Top Gun. Uh, you know, all of these movies have been delayed. But then some of the movies over the last year that were scheduled to be released in the summer uh, got purchased. And, and that's the story of today's movie, uh, The Mitchells versus The Machine. It was a, a Sony production that, that was shelved only to be purchased by Netflix. And six weeks ago, it was released straight to streaming. Uh, the Mitchells versus The Machines is a fun story that describes a family adventure, uh, this giant road trip where this Mitchell family is, is set and thrust into this scenario where they have to, to save the world from a robot apocalypse. Uh, to get to know the Mitchells, it's important to recognize that they are really a cross between uh, the Griswolds of National Lampoon's fame and, uh, and an accident-prone, super-powerless, dysfunctional Incredibles. Uh, so you have this drama of this family of ordinary people, each complete with their own idiosyncrasies and interests, but what draws them together is their shared addiction uh, of, of technology or, or, or their smartphones specifically. And so I want you to get a chance to, to meet the Mitchells if you haven't seen them. Uh, it, it's important to know that the subplot of this whole movie also is the relationship since it's Father's Day weekend between a father and his daughter. And in this opening scene, you'll get to meet all of the Mitchells. You'll get to see their struggle to balance their relationships with technology and their relationships with each other. And you'll also get to see the dynamics of misunderstanding and disconnection between Rick Mitchell and Katie Mitchell, the father and, and the daughter. Let's take a look. Okay, so this is hard to watch, isn't it? Maybe because it, it's all too familiar. Uh, I mean, here is this family. They, they, they want to connect. They want to be together. You know, Rick comes in and he has this rule. Okay, put your devices down. Ten seconds of, of eye contact. I mean, he, they want to engage, but there's something about them that is preventing them from doing so. You know, they can't get past their screens. They, they, they become so connected or dependent that, that it's unnatural to want to, to, to look at each other in the eyes or to or to engage with the people that they're with. And, and this is the, the storyline of the Mitchells versus the machines. It's, it's a, a storyline that, that feels all too familiar to us, especially as we've been emerging from this 14-month, you know, 15-month month, 15 month long season of, of being you know, together you know, alone uh, in our own homes behind screens using technology. I mean, the, the rate at which we have been using uh, you know, social media, uh, smartphones, uh, you know, being connected to, to learn or to be at, at work, we, we have become so exponentially uh, dependent upon our technology that's supposed to connect us, and yet it leaves us feeling disconnected, which is something that most of us 
uh, can relate with. I, I wonder how you're doing with technology and how connected you're feeling uh, these days. My guess is that if you ask anybody about how it is that they interact with social media or, or scrolling down, down different uh, you know, Instagram or, or, or Facebook platforms or, or how they're doing in terms of their, their connectedness with each other but also with technology, you're going to get a variety of answers. People have probably uh, used technology as a lifeline during the last 15 months, but just as many people would say that it's had a detrimental impact on their life in that same period of time. I was watching this scene and I was recognizing that this is beyond technology because, because this is a generational misunderstanding. I, I look at Rick and, and how he's trying to engage with his daughter and, and, uh, and he just doesn't understand her. He doesn't know how to communicate with her. He doesn't understand her art or her passion or, or what she's feeling. And, and she's using a screen to try to communicate all those things as her last way to, to say goodbye to the family that she loves. And, and there's a disconnect. You know, technology should bring us together, but it's leaving us feeling out of touch from one another, disconnected or isolated. You know, a couple of years ago, there was a photographer who did a series of, of, uh, of pictures on, on how technology is changing how we relate with each other, changing our posture, changing how it is that we connect with those who we're with. And in this series of pictures, they, 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 they took ordinary scenes of life and they removed the, the devices from our hands. These are the series of pictures that you can take a look at. These tools, this technology that's supposed to draw us closer together, separates us, leaves us feeling disconnected or out of touch. I love this last picture where you can see the, the only one who is unplugged is the only one who is aware that somebody is a taking a picture. This boy is, is in the present while mom and dad are, are in their devices. I wonder how you are at, at navigating through your relationship with technology in your relationships uh, that matter the most to you with your family or your loved ones. One of the things we recognize about this movie is that this family is right in the, in the middle of both of these battles. They're trying to balance their technology and, and they're trying to balance their family and the relationships between both. And whether they'd like to believe it or not or would admit it or not, it's having a negative impact uh, on their life. I want you to see just how dependent they are on technology and how it's changing uh, their frame of mind, their understanding of who they are. Uh, let's take a look. I love what Katie screams. She says, I'm missing everything. I mean, that happens to us when we're looking through our, our social media feeds. It's though everybody else is living this extraordinary, interesting, adventurous life, but, but we aren't. We're missing out on everything. And then we begin to think of ourselves as being less than or, or, or not worthy of or, or unpostable. Like we're the only ones that are living uninteresting kinds of lives. You look at Linda, the, the, the mom, Linda Mitchell, and she's looking at the posy. She's obsessing with the posy. She sees their, their stream as a picture of perfection when it comes to family life. She, she longs to be like them. Their influence has, has kind of pushed her to want to live a life that pretends to be like theirs, that, that strives to be like theirs. It's, it's influencing everything that they are, their mindset of who they are and who they should be. And, uh, and, and you can see this influence throughout the movie but perhaps no better place than in this next scene. The robot apocalypse is, is, is breaking out and, and now they're surrounded by really danger and, 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 and invasion. And so in this crisis, the Mitchell family is hunkering down, afraid of how they're supposed to live forward. And, uh, and now you get to see fully the influence that this Posey family has on their life. Let's take a look. In the middle of a crisis, I love it, they ask, what would a fully functioning family do? And enter the posies. And, and this perfect family comes in with their butterfly formation, and it leaves them wanting to, to imitate them, to do the same thing, to become like them instead of just being who they are. And, and what that does is it leads them to failure, to calamity, to disaster. This is what happens when we spend too much time or, or leave social media or technology uh, you know, unchecked. It leads us to want to be something different to pretend to be something we aren't. It leaves us feeling as though we aren't worth much or that our lives and the lives that we lead aren't enough. And if that's how you feel, if that's what your relationship with technology leaves you feeling like, then what I want to tell you is to stop. Put down your phone. Log off social media. Because there's no use in doing anything, engaging in anything that leaves you feeling less than like you're not enough. 
I mean, especially as people of faith, because one of the things that we learn about, about God through Scripture is that, that more than anything else, that, that, that you are enough, that, that, that God of the universe who created you, who breathed the breath of life into you, uh, sees you and, and sees you as very good, sees you as enough, sees you as his, as his child, precious in his sight. Throughout Scripture, we read stories of God chasing after his creation, pursuing them so that they might experience this love that won't let them go, that, that will seek them out when they are lost, that will rescue them uh, when they're down and, and out, and, and do so in a way that allows them to believe and to know fully that God will never leave them or forsake them, that God's love will go with them always just because of who you are, where you are. One of the beautiful stories about, about God in Scripture is that God loves you. You are not a mistake. God chooses you. God didn't make a mistake with you. God sees you as his beloved child and longs more than anything to know, for you to know that you are precious in his sight, the most important thing to him in the whole wide world. This is a father's love. This is also the, the love that we see shown through, demonstrated by the life of, of Jesus Christ. Jesus, he refers to his disciples and, and speaks to them and says, look, you guys didn't choose me. I chose you. I, I called you, and, and I, I, I didn't make a mistake when I did so. And in fact, I, I called you, I chose you, I equipped you to bear fruit, fruit that will last so that you can go and, and do the things that I do. Jesus reminds us that his love will go with us to the end of the age. Jesus reminds his disciples that, that he chose them. And God doesn't make a mistake with those whom he chooses. Throughout Scripture, you see God choosing people, anointing people, unlikely people, unexpected people, misfit people, ordinary people like the Mitchells, ordinary people like you and me. He sees us as enough, worthy of his love. God didn't make a mistake with you. He loves you just the way you are. You are enough. If engaging in technology, if engaging uh, on social media, if, if engaging screens that are in front of you leaves you feeling less than, then you need to put them down. Otherwise, they're going to be left unchecked and they'll take over the whole world like a robot apocalypse. And they'll distance you from the ones that you love the most. They'll even distance you from yourself. Wendy and I are, are talking about, my wife and I are talking about technology and our use of screens in our household almost daily these days. You know, we have a six-year-old son and, and we're trying to, to check ourselves, to ask ourselves, are we being present enough with each other? Are we modeling good use of technology and screen time? Are we giving Freddie too much screen time or not enough screen time? Are we, are we modeling good behavior so that we aren't pretending to be somebody that we aren't? Are we being true to ourselves? And so we've been establishing ground rules, ways that we can set boundaries for how it is that we engage with technology or, or immerse our lives in, in screens or social media. And, and these are some suggestions for you to consider as you, as you manage your own relationship with technology and the ones that you love the most. The first thing we'd suggest is that, that you should consider putting all of your devices, your smartphones, your, 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 your you know, watches, everything that you have that, that has alerts, putting those on airplane mode. Uh, before you go to bed. And if all possible, uh, put those devices in a room other than your bedroom so that every night before you go to bed, you can engage in sleep uninterrupted. Nothing should wake you from your sleep. Nothing is so important. No like or, or, or dislike or, or, or any sort of follow is important enough for you to, to not get a good night's sleep. And so what would it look for you to, to place boundaries uh, uh, around uh, your usage of, of your devices uh, during uh, your sleep time? Another thing we want to consider you or invite you to consider is to, to limit your smartphone usage or media consumption to certain hours of the day only. Uh, we have a rule that says no screens before breakfast. We also have a rule that says no screens during or after dinner. And in those moments, because family life is difficult, where we can't uh, you know, meet one of those rules or follow one of those rules, we'll say no screen time 30 minutes before bedtime. Again, we're trying to limit the kind of control that these devices have over our lives so that we can be present in living with people here and now, the ones that matter the most to us. The last suggestion is to take one weekend off every, every month. What would it look like in your household or in your own life uh, if you were to put your phone uh, away or all your devices away Friday night after you get home from work and, and leave them packed away, turned off until Monday morning after breakfast? How free would you feel just to be present in, in, in the company that you're keeping for a whole weekend, one weekend every month, just to experience life and to live it fully? These are some suggestions for boundaries that you can place on your relationship with technology so that you can engage more fully in the relationships that matter the most to you uh, in the life 
uh, that you're leading. And this is the, the, the main message of, of Mischolds versus the machines. You know, in this story, you see this family trying to balance their relationship with technology, but also trying to balance their relationships with their family. And so one of the things that we recognize is that we have to put boundaries on our relationship with technology. But that's not all Mitchells versus the Machines is about. It's also a story that describes the, the stressed and strained relationship between a father and his daughter. And you see that scene that we began with this sermon uh, where Rick breaks his daughter's computer right before she's about to go off to school. Moments after that laptop breaks, you know, uh, Katie, she screams out. She says, this is exactly why I don't want to stay here any longer, why I'm excited to go away to school and to never come back. And all of a sudden we see the, the dejected dad who's living with regret. He was once close with his daughter. It was his baby girl, but now over a series of time, uh, or his whole season of time has passed, he's become disconnected. He doesn't understand her. He doesn't know her. And he's at a loss for what he should do. His wife speaks into him and says, you've done so good at fixing everything in our house all of these years. Now it's time for you to fix this, meaning his relationship with his daughter. But he doesn't know what to do to repair their relationship. And so he turns to a camcorder that has all of his old family films and family footage on it. And he longs to get back to the way things once were. And so he sits in front of his TV and he begins to watch all of the footage, hoping to remember the love and the life that they used to share. And this is what he sees. There's power when we take time to stop and, and remember you know, Rick, he's looking through all of this family footage. He's remembering the love that they shared, the love that they experienced, the life that they had. And it compels him to, to action. He starts to live with urgency. He has a mission now, and it's to restore and to reconcile his relationships, not just with his daughter, but his whole family, to bring them back together. And so over the, the night, he, he cancels his daughter's plane ticket to go to college by herself, and, and, he, and he sets up all the logistics so they can go on this giant, epic, like, family road trip as one family, to take Katie back to college. And, and as they set out, he's living with this urgency, and I'm compelled by his urgency because this is how we ought to live all of the time. We ought to push aside technology to, to live with intentionality and focus on, on the ones that we love the most with urgency. And this is what we read in Scripture, too. I was reminded of, of, of James' letter to the early church, and, and in it he, he talks about how fleeting life is, how, how fast and quickly time flies, especially uh, in our life together. And this is what he writes to the church you don't really know about tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears only for a short while before it vanishes. James is saying, like in other words, time flies. Our, our life together is short, and so we need to live with urgency. We need to live with intentionality. We need to live with pace. We need to focus on the ones that matter the most. We need to, to love more. We need to forgive more. We need to savor e each moment. We need to embrace our, our children, our friends, our family, just as they are. And we ought not to waste any time in doing so. And in those moments where we've made mistakes, in those moments where there's hurt and, and, and brokenness, what we need to seek to do with everything we have is to, to attempt to reconcile, to choose to love still, and to never waste a day in doing so. We ought to live with urgency uh, to love those around us. We ought to do everything in our power to express and to communicate love to the ones that we love the most. And, and this is exactly what the point of the story that we read in Scripture was today. In Luke 15, Jesus describes uh, the story of, of God's heart, a picture of the kingdom of heaven. And in so doing, he, he narrates a story of a father who had two sons. It's the prodigal son story. And this is what we read there. There was a man with two sons, said Jesus. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. Jesus tells this story describing the heart of God. And, and, and we call it the prodigal son story, but it's really a story about a father, a, a good father. And, and he has this younger son and an older son. The younger son wants his inheritance. And so he gives it to him. And, and then that son goes and he spends all of his inheritance in dissolute living. He, he goes far and wide. He dines with pigs and prostitutes. And maybe he's doing that for weeks or maybe he's doing that for years. Who knows? But he's gone. Nowhere to be found until he hits rock bottom. He finds himself sitting in a ditch on the side of the road eating carob pods, which is the food of desperation. And in that moment where he's all alone, he's by himself, he's drawn to remember. And, and he begins to think about his father's love. He thinks, my dad loves me. He'll, he'll never leave me. 
He has to take me back. And he began to remember all of the, the hired hands that worked on his father's you know, business. And he said, even if I could go back, my dad would take me back as a hired hand because he never let them go hungry. He took care of them always. This prodigal son, remembering his father's love, he was compelled to action. He, he was drawn to this life of urgency, and he, he doubles back to, to return home. And, and as this prodigal returns home with urgency to reconcile this relationship with his dad, his dad sees him and welcomes him with open arms, puts, puts his, his arms around him, a robe around him, and throws his big party. I, I love the prodigal son story because of his urgency, fueled by his remembrance of this deep love for him that they shared, it, it changed the way that he lived his life. This is what you see in Rick Mitchell's story. This is also what you end up seeing in Katie Mitchell's story. You see, they go on this epic road trip adventure where they are fighting against robots, this robot takeover, and, and they're doing all of these extraordinary things. But, but in that course of action, Katie begins to tell lies. She starts to hurt her family and the trespasses against her family leaves her all alone, where she's sitting in the dark on the side of the road with her brother. And in her place of desperation, just like the prodigal, she seeks to remember her father's love. And this is what she sees. You know, somewhere along the line, she lost sense of how much her, her dad loved her. You know, there was so much separation, so much misunderstanding, so much hurt that she had forgotten her dad's love. She remembers it in, the, in this scene. She sees vignettes, glimpses of it spread out over time. It's a beautiful collage of, of love that, that changes her. It compels her to action. She says, I'm going to make it up to you, buddy. And what she does is she sets out from that place to, to be just like the prodigal. She, she repents and she confesses and she does everything she can to get back to her family as quickly as she can to, to salvage it, to be reconnected, to live fully and to love fully in the same kind of way. What happens is Katie connects with her dad and they, they conquer the world. They defeat the robots. They save everything and everybody is happy. It's this beautiful picture of a happy ending. At least that's the movie. That's not necessarily real life. That's also not how the prodigal son story ends. One of the things you recognize about the prodigal son story, the story that Jesus tells us about the, the kingdom of heaven or the heart of God, is that, that, that as, as the prodigal son returns, there's this great celebration. You know, the dad goes and, and wraps this, this beautiful robe around his son who was lost that is now found, and, and he calls the whole city, the whole town to come and celebrate, to, to, to celebrate what once was dead that, that is now back alive. And, and he invites everybody, and everybody shows up except one person. That one person's the older brother. In fact, when you read through the parable, it's almost as you, you forget there is an older brother to begin with. The older brother isn't happy. Not everybody was happy that the, the prodigal returned. The older brother was unhappy. And so he ran away. You know, he was the faithful one. He was the, the righteous one. He was the one that, that stayed. He was the one that, that did everything that was asked of him. He was the one that was always there and and now my dad is going to celebrate my, my, my younger brother. Now my dad is going to welcome him and invite the whole town to, to, to party for him. He wasn't having anything of the sort. And so he ran away. He was lost. Which prompted this dad into action. It compelled this dad to then go and to find his, his lost son, he doesn't waste a minute, but he goes and he, and he finds him. And as he finds him, he, he calls his adult son child. And then he says, don't you know that, that, that I love you? That I've been with you this whole time? That you have been with me in the same kind of way? Don't you know that I've given you everything I have and, and all that I am, what's mine is yours? And he begins to plead to his lost son. He begins to, to meet him right where he is in a very different kind of way, in a way that he needed to be met in a way that he, as a unique child of this father, needed to be loved. And this father did just that. And what you recognize is that the prodigal son's story isn't a story about a younger son. It's, it's not even the story about a, a dad. It's about uh, God's love that, that loves all of God's children, as unique and different as they may be, in a way that, that they need specifically, according to who they are. 
God's love is extravagant. The Father's love is, is willing to meet us wherever it is that we may be, to, to find us, no matter how lost we may seem, to love us in just the way that we need. Because we are, are God's child. Because we are, are, are the most important thing to the God of the universe who loves us, who will never leave us or forsakes us. He loves us just the way that we are. The story of the prodigal son is a story that reveals the heart of a good father, the heart of the God of the universe who seeks to love us unconditionally, just as we are, where we are. You know, one of my favorite sculptures, it depicts this parable uh, of the prodigal and, and, and of this father's love so beautifully. It reveals the, the, the pain and the expression of, 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 of each one of these characters, and I think it depicts it so beautifully. But here you get to see a father with both of his sons, the younger clinging to his father's waist, the older standing defiant, unwilling to celebrate, and yet this dad seeking to love both with everything he has and in, in all that he is. We are each uniquely made each one of us carries our own imperfections and idiosyncrasies. And yet we are all God's children. And God loves us. He won't stop until he finds us. He, he won't stop until he meets us right where we are. And then he'll love us in a way that we need to feel loved. So that we know that we are worthy. That we are lovable. That we are precious in God's sight. That our lives are enough no matter how many other feeds or, or, or streams might communicate or make us feel otherwise. I think about this, this parable and I think about this day. You know, it's Father's Day weekend. And I don't know what Father's Day means to you. I don't know how it makes you feel. I was fortunate enough to have a dad that, that communicated this kind of love to me regularly throughout my childhood and even into my adulthood. He'll still comment on my sermons. He probably won't like this one but he's been with me all of the time. But that's not everybody's story. A, a lot of people have bad history with their fathers where their fathers uh, weren't present or, or didn't love them or were abusive or were hurtful. They were the opposite of this picture of a dad in Jesus' story about the kingdom of heaven. And what I want you to know is that, that regardless of your experience of fathers on Father's Day, you need to know that you are loved. You need to know that you are enough. You need to know that you are worthy. You need to know that the God of the universe will do anything to, to meet you where you are, to find you wherever it is that you may be hiding so that you would know and grow to experience this love that won't let you go, that makes us whole, that makes it possible for us to do extraordinary things, that gives us the ability to have the capacity to love others in the same kind of way. Mitchell's vs. the Machines is a, a movie about moving technology to the fringes of our life so that we can pay attention and, and love the people who are closest to us with everything we have and all that we are. So that we would know how to, how to meet people in their unique idiosyncrasies with their unique uh, you know, personalities in a way that understands them for who they are and loves them just because. As we think about the words of James and, and what it means to live with urgency, during our fleeting lives, what Mitchell's verse the machine tells us to do is to love more, to forgive freely, uh, to embrace our children, our family, those around us just as they are. And in those moments where we have failed or made mistakes, we need to, to reconcile. We need to choose to love one another still. And that's my hope for us this Father's Day is that we would know that we are loved unconditionally by a good father and that because of that love, we are able to love others in the same way. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of today. And we thank you for the moments that we have together in loving relationships. We thank you for the moments that we have together in worship with you. Because regardless of our relationships and the status of them, when we are with you, we know of your promise of forever love. We know that you love us, that we are enough, that we are worthy, 
to be loved. That you didn't make a mistake with us. So help us to know that all over again. And then inspire us and compel us to seek to love others in the very same way. Do all of that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching this week's sermon. We'd love for you to join us again online or live in worship. To learn more about Church of the Resurrection, please visit core.org. Have a great week.